All right, we're going to start our chapter on factoring. The chapter on factoring in Math 307, we only do three sections. So we're not going to learn everything that is available to learn about factoring. We're just going to look at three sections. Those of you who take intermediate algebra, you will start over and do the entire chapter in that course. So what you learn now is like a bonus for what you're going to take with you to intermediate. But not everybody takes intermediate. So there are some skills that we just have to get in this course. All right, factoring polynomials. Let me ask you if you remember about factoring in general. Probably sometime in your early math life, you did some factoring. You took perhaps the number 12. And if someone just said, what are the factors of 12? You might come up with some combinations. You might say, well, 1 times 12 is a pair of factors, 2 times 6 is a pair of factors, and 3 times 4 is a pair of factors. Those are all factors of 12. Then you probably went on and learned a little bit more, and you learned about prime factors. With prime factors, and I know that you did this if you took Math 301, you might take the number 12, and I'd say, okay, give me any old factors you can think of. And by the way, this is all just lead-in material for this lesson. And you might say, well, I was thinking 2 times 6. Are either one of those a prime number? Okay, actually, 2 is the prime number because a prime number is defined to be a number that has only one way to factor it, 1 times the number. There's only one way to get a 2, 1 times 2. But 6 is not prime. It's what's called composite because there's more than one way to get 6. There's 1 times 6, but there's also 3 times 2 or 2 times 3. It doesn't matter which way you write it. Those are primes. The prime factorization of 12 is, you could say 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. Okay. What we're going to do is find the prime factors of polynomials, not of numbers. Okay? So in other words, we're going to take a polynomial, maybe x squared plus 5x plus 6, and we're going to find out what times what gave us that. We're going to go back and review all of our techniques of multiplication because we're about to undo them all. Factoring polynomials starts out with the concept of the greatest common factor. It is the greatest, biggest factor that you can factor out of all the terms of the polynomial. And the greatest common factor is reversing the distributive property. We're going to reverse the distributive property. So let me remind you of the, of the distributive property. If I had 5x squared times 3x to the third minus 4x squared plus 7. If I ask you to use the distributive property and do that multiplication, what is 5x squared times 3x to the third? 15x to the fifth, because you would use the product rule which says to add the exponents, minus 20x to the fourth plus 35x squared. What we're going to be doing in our lesson on 6.2 is looking at a polynomial that's kind of like this one that I'm pointing at, and we're going to say what is a common factor? What goes into 15, 20, and 35? And hopefully you'll say 5 does. And then I'll say, okay, do you see that all the terms have x's? Yes. The most you can take out is the low power. That's the most you can get out of all of them. So the greatest common factor will turn out to be 5x squared. And we're going to undo the, re the distributive property. So let's take a look at the questions in my math lab that have to do with this. 
The first question asks you to factor 2x plus 18. And the instructions actually say, factor out the greatest common factor from the polynomial. When you take a test, though, all it's going to say is factor completely. It's not going to give you a method, just factor completely. OK, so greatest common factor. Just look at the terms. Do you see a number that goes into both of those? Two. Do you see a variable that goes into both of them? No, because the 18 doesn't have an x. So the greatest common factor is just a 2. And I will open parentheses. Now here's what I do. When I factor a 2 out, I'm dividing it out. So I'm going to write a little baby 2 under each one of those and do the division. 2 goes into 2x, x times, and 2 goes into 18, 9 times. And then I'll close the parentheses. I have the prime factors, although my number is a possibility my number is not a prime, but I have what are called prime polynomial factors of this original problem. How could you check it? Multiply. Multiply. Use the distributive property. 2, at, 2 times x is 2x, and 2 times positive 9 is positive 18. Let's look at the next one. I have 8x minus 4. Is there a common factor? Four. Now, I probably shouldn't have said it the way I did. I said, is there a common factor? I should have said, what's the greatest common factor? Because two is a factor, but I wouldn't want you to factor out two. You need to factor out the biggest thing you can, which turns out to be four. And if I divide each of these by four, what will I get as my other factor? 2x minus one. Is that OK? All right. Next problem involves some variables. So we get to look at some variables. I have x to the seventh plus 3x to the sixth. Do you see a common numerical or number factor? Because the leading coefficient is a 1, I think the answer to that is no. I do not have a common factor. Is there a common variable? Yes. They both have x's. The greatest common factor will be the lowest power. I cannot take more than x to the sixth out of this term. So I have to take the low power. So the greatest common factor will be x to the sixth. And it may be difficult for you to read that little bitty minuscule x to the sixth that I've written there. But to figure out what the second factor is, I'm using the quotient rule. x to the seventh over x to the sixth gives you x to the implied first plus what happens to these x's? They cancel out which really means there's like a 1 left behind, but 3 times 1 is still 3. And those are my factors. Can you check it? x to the 6th times x gives me x to the 7th. x to the 6th times 3 gives me 3x to the 6th. The greatest common factor is the lowest power. All right, let's look at 20 y to the seventh plus 32 y to the fourth. Is there a number that's in common to both terms? Four, and that's the greatest one, so I'll write it down. Is there a common variable? Y, and what power can I take? Fourth. So I'm going to divide by 4y to the fourth, 4y to the fourth. What does that give me for the first term? 5y to the third, because I'm using the quotient rule and I'm subtracting 4 from 7, plus 8, 
plain old eight. And somebody might say that the y to the fourths canceled out. Be careful with that concept of canceling. It really means that ones have been left behind, but one times eight is eight. So it appears as if it's just gone. Let's look at number five. I have 9x minus 63y plus 9. Is there a common numerical factor? 9. Is there a common variable? No. So when I factor the 9 out, and maybe I won't write divided by 9 this time, I'll just do it. 9 goes into 9x, x times. 9 goes into negative 63y minus 7y times. How many times does 9 go into 9? Once. So you've got to put the 1. That's where, let me go back now and sneak in those little 9s. This is where you have to be careful about that phrase cancel. If you say that those 9s cancel out, that doesn't really cause you any trouble. These 9s do, quote, cancel out, but they really divide out leaving little ones behind, and if you neglect to put that one, you don't have the right factors. Check it with distributive property. 9 times x is 9x. 9 times negative 7y is negative 63y. 9 times 1 is 9. If you didn't have a 1, you couldn't get that last term back. So these are your factors. All right, would you factor this next one? 12x to the third minus 10x squared plus 4x. common factor between 12, 10, and 4 is what? 2. And do you have a common variable factor? Yes, x. So if I divide each of these by 2x, that's going to leave me with what? 6x squared minus 5x plus 2. I used the quotient rule, which made me subtract 3 minus 1 gave me the 2, 2 minus the 1 gave me the 1, and these completely divided out. So the quotient rule says you have to subtract the exponents. Same thing up here when I had a y to the 7th over a y to the 4th. I subtracted for y to the 3rd. Now we're really going to get a good look at these exponents in problem number seven, and I'm going to actually rewrite it down here. So basically you're looking for like the, the greater common factor, and then you, you're looking for like same variables, mm -hmm. and then the least power would be if it has that the yes. greatest common Yes, it sounds a little contradictory yeah. that the smallest power is the greatest common factor, but it is. You're exactly right. Okay, I am about through copying down this kind of wild one. A to the seventh, B to the eighth, minus A to the fifth, B to the fourth, plus A to the fourth, B to the ninth, minus A to the fourth, B to the fourth. Okay. I don't see a numerical common factor in all of these terms, but I do see some variables. All right, they all have A's and they all have B's. Okay, but power. What is the low power of A? And what's the low power of B? Four. Because as you look at all of these, the lowest of all the A powers is four. These both have the four. And the lowest of all the B powers is also a four. So 
A to the fourth, B to the fourth. And I, you know, I'm going to scoot that down a little bit to give myself some more room. Because I have to now divide each of these by A to the fourth, B to the fourth. And I am using the quotient rule to do it. All right, in the first one, what will I get for my power of A? A to the third, 7 minus 4 is 3. B to the fourth, 8 minus 4 is 4. Next term, it's going to be a negative. A to the 5 minus 4 is implied 1. I won't write the 1. What about the Bs? Cancel out. Divide out. That's fine. You don't write the B because its power would be 0 and B to the 0 is equal to 1. All right, plus in the third term, the A to the fourths divide out and I get what? B to the fifth, 9 minus 4. And what will the last term be? It will be a 1 because the A's divide out, the B's divide out, and when things divide out, 1 is left behind. Um, because this one came from here, and this one came from here, and that was its sign. Why would you write a 1 where the b to the 4th is b to the 4th? You could, back over here, but it would be a times 1, which is just a. Same thing would have happened here. It would have been 1 times b to the 5th, and because of the identity, we wouldn't have written it. But when there is nothing else, then that one becomes critical that it's written. Okay? So this has gotten kind of ugly. Wait, so whenever the exponents like cancel out, you don't even put the variable? I don't, because if the exponents are the same on top and bottom, the quotient rule would say for this one that I would get a times b to the zero. But what is b to the 0? It is 1. This one would be a to the 0, four minus 4. But a to the 0 is 1. So when they, and I'm using quotes, cancel out. There's a 1 left behind. If it's times something else, I don't write it. If it's all alone, I do write it. Is that OK? All right. We, um, we're going to skip number 8 because it's just more of the same. This was, this was 7. Um, I want to make up a problem to demonstrate something that may or may not show up in this lesson in Math Lab, but will show up sometime somewhere. What if you had negative 5x to the second plus 15x? Um, possibly yes. Everybody, be good note takers, write this down. All right, when I ask you about a common factor, and you look at this, does everybody see that 5 goes into both of those? Mm -hmm. And that they both contain a factor of x. Here is something that is not necessarily intuitive. I mean, you might not just realize this. If the last, I'm sorry, if the first term is a negative term, <coughs> always factor out a negative common factor. So not only will I factor out a 5x, but I will factor out a negative 5x because the leading term was negative. All right, so if I divide each of these by negative 5x, it will change their signs. So negative 5x squared divided by negative 5x, negative divided by negative is positive. positive, and I'll get x. What happens to the last term? Positive divided by negative is, positive. a positive divided by negative is a negative 3. So I'm going to write a little note. If the first term of a polynomial is negative, comma, factor 
out a negative GCF. Off, yes. Why didn't you bring down this square, the x squared? For this factor? No, for the... For, for here? Uh -huh. Because if I divide an x squared by the x, what do I do with the exponents? Quotient rule says subtract them. Oh, okay. So it's 2 minus an implied 1. Okay. Okay? Now, let me do one more little example of, to demonstrate this again. What if I have negative x squared plus 3x minus 8? And I say... I'd like you to factor that, and you say, "All righty, I'm supposed to do so. I'm supposed to go looking for a greatest common factor." Well, this is an implied negative one. This is a three. This is a negative eight, and they don't seem to have anything in common. But the rule about if the leading term is negative still holds. So what I'll do in this weird case is factor out simply a negative one. The thing is, as math people, we just don't like our leading terms to stay negative. We just don't like it. So if you were to divide a negative 1 out of each of those, what would happen? What's negative divided by negative? Positive, x squared. What's positive divided by negative? Negative, 3x. And then negative over negative is positive 8. So that might not seem like it's of much value to you, but it really is a good thing for some future lessons we're going to do. If the leading term is negative, if it has a common factor like the 5x, factor out a negative 5x. If the leading term is negative and there is no other common factor, go ahead and factor out a negative 1. You could not, because could you divide this 8 by an x? No. It's not common to all of them. Okay? So now let's, is everybody okay with greatest common factor? All right. We're going to look at now um, another technique which is used in a specific circumstance. It's called grouping. This is still 6.1. 6.1 has two topics in it. This is the second one. This is factoring. by grouping is used when the polynomial, and I'm going to abbreviate that, just call it poly, has four or more terms. Now, each of the skills that I teach you for the rest of the class will be specific for a certain number of terms. Greatest common factor, you look for a common factor no matter how many terms there are. But going on from there, if the polynomial has four or more, you're going to try something called grouping. And then 6.2 teaches us something about if it has three terms. And 6.5, which we jump to, teaches us something about binomials, two terms. And I promise I'll summarize all of that at the end. All right, the first two problems that sort of get classified as grouping are really halfway done for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and look. And it may turn out that these would be best done, and I think they would be, by me going to my blank paper. Okay, so I'll be copying down the problems. All of these will tell me to factor, and they may say factor by grouping, but I'm not going to tell you that. All right, problem number nine. I have y times x to the fourth minus 3 plus 4 times x to the fourth minus 3. All right, I want you to hold off on this for just a minute, and I want to think about a parallel or similar question. 
what if I had y times z plus 4 times z? Does everybody see a common factor of z? Okay, and what would you do? Wouldn't you factor it out? You would take the z and put it out in front, and what would be left over? Y plus 4. Is everybody okay with that? That's just common factor. In our problem, we have something that's similar, but in the place of the z, I have a binomial in parentheses, an x to the fourth minus 3, and an x to the fourth minus 3. This is what's known as a common binomial factor. It's in this group, and it's in this group. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just like with the z where I pulled the z out in front, I'm going to take the common binomial of x to the fourth minus 3 and put it out in front. Now, what is left over? Excellent. It is y plus 4. So I'll put that in the other factors parentheses and we have factored it because remember factors are things multiplied together to get this now this is not truly grouping yet but you'll see why they made up these problems as we move on number 10 is kind of like it I have y times x minus 8 minus 5 times x minus 8, and I'm supposed to factor that. Whoops. All right. The common, do you see that the common factor is x minus 8? Okay. Now, if I factor that out in front, what will be my leftover factor? y minus 5, and the sign always comes with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, in problem number 11, we're going to have to do all the grouping to get it to this stage, but it's not difficult. Number 11, we're going to use grouping, and I'm going to say certain things that it's the way I think about it, and I hope this is helpful. I have x to the third plus 2x squared plus 4x plus 8. All right. The first thing, when you're taking a test on factoring, always start a problem and say, hmm, I wonder if all of these terms have a common factor. Not just three out of four, but all. And the answer is no. These three have a common factor of two. These three have a common factor of x, but none of them have the same common factor to all. So I cannot do greatest common factor. So after I've either done that or didn't do that, then I count the terms. And I have one, two, three, four. And when I have four terms, it means grouping. So. I will promise you that within this course, you can always group these first two, second two. It'll always work. Now, I want you to look at just the first two. Ignore the others for a minute. Just look at the first two and pretend that's your whole problem. Is there a common factor between just the first two? X, and it has to be X squared. So I'll factor X squared out. And if it helps you to write it down that you're dividing it out, then please do that. x to the third over x squared gives me x. And 2x squared over x squared, do you agree those go away? And plus 2. Now, ignore these two and look at just the second two. All right, is there a common factor in the second group? 4. And because the first term is positive, I put plus 4. If the first term is negative, I put minus. Okay, I'm going to divide by 4, divide by 4. What will that give me? X, X plus 2. Now, the problems are rigged. 
it will work out. So if you're doing it right, those will always turn out to be the same. If they don't, you made a mistake because I know the problems are all rigged. What is the common binomial factor that I'm going to write in front? What is the leftover factor? X squared, X squared plus 4. Please make sure that at the end of your problem, it is a product. It is the multiplication of those two. Don't put a plus sign between them. It is a product. Now, if somebody asks you to check that, to check greatest common factor, we use the distributive property. To check this, we check with FOIL if you want to check it. Okay. The product of the first, what is x times x squared? x to the third, and there it is. Outer product, x times 4. 4x. Well, it's not second, but it is here, and the commutative property says it doesn't matter where it is. The inner product, 2 times x squared, 2x squared, so there it is. Product of the last, 2 times 4 is 8. The outers and inners were not like terms in this, so you could check it with FOIL. All right, let's look at number 12. Oops. I'm supposed to factor 2x plus 12 plus xy plus 6y. There is no common factor to all of those terms, so I count. 1, 2, 3, 4. Four terms, grouping. First group, second group. What's the common factor in the first group? 2. So if I divide each of those by 2, what will I get? Okay, I, I'm not sure if I heard you right. The 2's cancel, so I get x plus 6. I thought I heard a 2x plus 6, but anyway, it is x plus 6. So if I finish this problem correctly, what will I get when I factor out a common factor of the second group? I will get an x plus 6, so it better happen. What do you see as a common factor? Y. y. So if I factor out a y, I put plus y. I divide each of these by y, and I get x plus 6. It's kind of self-checking. I get the same binomial if I'm doing it correctly. So the common factor is x plus 6 times 2 plus y. Is that okay? You could check it with FOIL, but I'm not going to take the time to do that every time. All right, I'm going to write down number 13, and I'd like you to do 13 on your own. I have 10x to the third minus 15x squared plus 6x minus 9. And I'd like you to factor that by grouping. Did you find a common factor to all of the terms? No, and there's not one. There's a 3 that is a factor of some of them, a 5 is a factor of some, x is a factor of some, but there's not a anything that's a factor to all of them. So I've grouped them as the first two and the second two. 
in the first two, what did you come up with as a common factor? 5x squared. 5x squared. 5x to the second. So we divide by 5x to the second, 5x to the second, and what does that give us? 2x minus 3. So I sure hope when I work on that second group that I get another 2x minus 3. So I look at the second group, what's in common? Okay, and it's a positive 3. So I divide each of those by 3 and I get 2x minus 3. All right, so do I have a common binomial factor? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll put that out in front, 2x minus 3, and the leftover factor is made up of 5x five five squared plus a 3. On the, when he started on the left side, mm -hmm. I had just put 5. Okay, which means that you didn't get out the greatest common factor. You did find a common factor, but you didn't get the variable common part. And that's what happened. Okay, so you want to look real. And you probably had some sense that something wasn't going right because this binomial didn't match up to this one. That should tell you to go back. Okay, let's look at... Number 14, something important and different about 14. I have 5m to the third plus 6mn minus 5m squared minus 6n. And it says to factor. Well, I look at all the terms, and I don't have a common factor to all of them, and I don't think you're going to find a problem in Math Lab where you do. So I'll say, well, there's four terms, so let me try some grouping. What is in common in the first group? Just letter M. What is 5M to the third over M? 5 m squared. Using the quotient rule, we subtracted the exponents. What happens when you divide 6m in by an m? Right, you get 6m. So I'm hopeful that 5m squared plus 6n is what I end up with over here. Now look at the second group, and this is why I picked this problem to do. Um, do you see anything in common? No, but what do you notice? Okay, a negative leading term of the second group. So I have to factor out a negative. If I don't have a number to factor out, what do I try? One. one. So I will put minus one, and when I divide that by minus one, I get positive 5m squared, and I get positive 6n. So now, am I confident that I'm doing it right? Yes. yes. Now, let me say something. If, if this had already been, the part I'm pointing to right now, if this had already been positive 5m squared plus 6n, then you would have had to put a 1 here. Because to do it by grouping, you have to have a number out here. So if there's no common factor that you can identify, do a 1. If the signs need changing, then use a negative one. Okay, greatest common factor, 5m squared plus 6n, and what's it times? M minus 1. And how could you check it? FOIL. All right, I want to jump to number 17 because there's just a whole lot more of the same. And I would like you to do 3x, sorry, 3x squared minus 9xy minus 7x plus 21y. And I wasn't very careful when I said I want you to do this. I should say I want you to factor this. Okay, so would you please factor that polynomial that has four terms in it?
resume. All right, there's not a common factor to all four terms, but there are four terms. So we will think about grouping the first group and the second group. What's the common factor in just the first group? Three, Three and an x. And how do you know to use the x or not use the x? If it is in this term and in this term, and that's all we're looking at, then it is in common, and it must be used, okay. and you lose, use the low power. You would put the 2 over if this x over here had a 2 on both. Yes, if this had a 2, then x squared would have been the best power to take. Okay. You take the lowest power that's there. Okay? And then I divide by it. If I have 3x squared divided by 3x, x and minus 3y. Okay, so now let's look at the second group. It, okay, it's been observed that we have a leading term of the second group that's negative. So whatever I factor out, it's got to be negative, and it's negative 7 because 7 goes into both the 7x and the 21y, do they have any common letters? No. no, so there's no variable. So I divide by negative 7, and I get negative divided by negative is positive x. Positive 21y divided by negative 7 is negative 3y. And I have every confidence that I'm doing it right because I got identical binomials. Write that binomial down, x minus 3y. And what's the other factor? 3x minus 7. 3x minus 7. So in the beginning, I know whenever you factored out 3x, mm -hmm. it wasn't the same thing as the other factor. Mm -hmm. And you divided 3x into 3x squared? Yes. How come the x didn't cancel out? Like, why were you looking at x? OK, if I just look at this piece right here, and I'm going to go down here to make sure it makes sense, where I have 3x squared over 3x. Well, a couple of things. I use the quotient rule. Those divide out. The quotient rule says if you have the same base, you subtract the exponents. Well, there's a 1 there. So, so it leaves you with the x to the implied first. Something else to help explain it, 3x squared is 3 times x times x, and this is just 3x. So cancel, cancel. Either way, you're left with an x. Okay? So we have now done greatest common factor and then grouping which used greatest common factor, and we did them both in section 6.1. So we're ready to move to 6.2.